Good afternoon. My name is Toddy Guttner, and I'll be hosting the afternoon session of the health panel. Welcome. I hope you all had a good lunch and are relaxed and happy to be back in the auditorium. I hear it was a fabulous morning this morning. Um, we're going to start the panel. Um, well, we're going to start the session. It'll be in two parts. Um, we will have Chris Wiebacher, the CEO of Sanofi, and the president and CEO of Genzyme come up to the podium and speak first for about 20, 25 minutes. And then um, he will leave, and I will introduce our two panelists with a brief introduction about a similar but related topic. And then both um, the panelists will have um, a brief talk about their uh, areas of expertise. Um, for about 20 minutes, and during that time, I will hope that you will be busy tweeting and messaging and texting and emailing me questions for the panel. While they're doing their presentation, though, I will not be taking questions. As soon as M Michael is finished with his presentation, we will open it up to questions and do our very best to answer every single one of them as best we can. But without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Chris Wiebacher, as I said, the CEO of Sanofi, and a huge supporter of the Women's Forum. He doesn't just say that he believes in diversity and gender equality as a strategy, as a strategic business objective. He actually acts on that principle at Sanofi. He has nearly 50% of his managers are women, and there are three women on the board. Mr. V. Bakker has been CEO of Sanofi mm -hmm. since 2008, and he came from a long career in pharmaceutical industry. Previously, he was the president of North American Pharmaceuticals for GlaxoSmithKline, um, and he also worked in other various senior positions at the company. In 2003, the French Republic recognized Mr. Wiebacher with his prestige in Légion d'honneur, correct? Sorry, my French is not so good, uh, award for his contribution to business and health care. Here to kick off this section and to speak with us today is Mr. Wiebacher, and he will share with us how science has changed the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiebacher. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be back. I appreciate the uh, invitation. We were particularly thrilled at Sanofi to see uh, today that we were fourth, uh, the, most, the fourth most attractive uh, company for, for women in, in France. Now, uh, we were excited about that, but I have to say that genetically, I'm not really all that excited about being fourth in anything. So we did have a good opportunity today over lunch. We're talking, about, we're talking to 30 of our most senior executives from around the world about how they saw us being able to improve and do, do even better. This afternoon, we're going to talk about science and health. Uh, and that's, I think, relevant for three reasons. The first is, is that this conference is extremely interested, obviously, in some of the big macro trends of what's going on in the world. And healthcare is clearly up there. If you look at where most government expenditure is, uh, if you look at some of the big cultural and social issues, they, they all concern health. Second reason is, is that in parts of the world, we're facing an economic crisis. And one of the ways that, that the economies have grown over the years is through innovation. And obviously within science, we have a huge opportunity in terms of being able to encourage innovation. Um, most countries have, have realized, if you talk to the leaders of countries around the world, how they see themselves as being competitive in a global economy, it's going to come down to human capital. And human capital is around education. It's, in, it's in about investing in great universities and in those industries that work with universities and obviously employ people that come out of them. And the third reason is very specific to this forum. Seven or eight decisions out of 10 in healthcare are made by women. In every family, and this is pretty much true around the world, most of the most important decisions around healthcare will be taken by women in the family. So for us, 
uh, it's extremely important that we understand these decision makers and, and are able to actually respond to that and we have a company uh, that reflects that reality of a marketplace. So let's talk about innovation first of all. And, and here you see 11,000 years of history on one slide. And you can see back in, in 9,000 BC, we started off with the agricultural revolution. And really, for at least 10,000 years, you know, we took a long time. You know, you see it took us uh, 5,000 years before we discovered the, uh, the plow. Um, mathematics didn't come until 7,000 years after that. But then you see year two, in, in when we started the, 9th, the 20th century, how everything has ramped up so dramatically. And within that, you also see a dramatic increase in the population. So there is a virtual cycle, virtuous cycle, if you will, of, of innovation, of improvement in outcomes, improvement in, in the population, and it's driven an awful lot of wealth. But you can really also see how much science has evolved in such a very short period of time. And this is only accelerating as we look at what's going to happen. Now, obviously, science has had a huge impact on all of our lives. Um, uh, lifespan increase has been more than 30 years in the US, 25 attributable to public health. Now clearly things like clean water, sanitation um, contribute to that, but obviously so do an awful lot of medical treatments and we'll come back to that. Significant decrease in, in infant mortality. In the United States in 1900, one in five babies born died. And, and that's obviously, uh, we now talk about infant mortality per thousand um, in, in today's world. But this one is also important. 50% of the world's economic growth in the last two centuries can be traced to medical research discoveries. This comes for two reasons. One is, is that there is a, this virtuous cycle where there's work with universities and hospitals, but there's also a, a massive amount of productivity that has been unleashed uh, because people can live longer, people can contribute longer in, in the workplace, and, and can actually um, uh, drive growth. Uh, if you look at some specific illnesses like heart attacks, you know, clearly there's been, a, especially the invention of the statins, contributed a 45% decrease in heart attack deaths and heart failure in, in a six-year period. And, and there you see the same thing um, really in terms of actual years. Um, and, and, you know, 1950, this is now for the world. 1950 for some of us doesn't seem like that long ago, um, but in the space of, of really two or three generations, we've seen a massive increase from 49 to 67 years. In many countries, uh, this is obviously well over 80 years. In, in some emerging markets, um, it's down around 50, but th there has been an inexorable increase. Now, this also has a big implication for a lot of our social security systems. You know, I started my life in, 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 in actually as, a, as an auditor with Price Waterhouse. When I used to audit pension reserves, for example, you assume somebody retired at age 65 and, and the average ex life expectancy was 72. Now, in, in many countries like Western Europe and the US, this is in the 80s. And so all of our social security systems are starting to have to finance people for a lot longer period. A major chunk of healthcare expenditure is in the last two years of life. And actually, when you look at the demographics of the population, those people who are actually working to support health care and Social Security uh, retirement has dropped. To give you an idea, in the United States in 1965, when the two major government health care programs were introduced, Medicare and Medicaid, there were 43 people working for every retired person. In today's world, that 43 people working for every retired per 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 person has dropped to three. And by 2025, there'll only be two people working for every person retired. So one of the things that we're looking at in this whole economic crisis is really a whole examination of our, our social funding model, um, which is really being driven by what you see on, on this chart here. Now, there are a number of, of healthcare interventions um, that are, have obviously been important. I think vaccines is one of the most important. And, and I raise it not only because of some of the amazing uh, statistics that you see here, uh, when you look at the, uh, the invention of diphtheria and whooping cough, uh, TB and tetanus vaccines, but what's really interesting is, is that this is a story about prevention. 
And this is the number one thing that is missing in our healthcare systems today. We will continue to invest billions in research, and we can advance science. But unless we actually get people healthier to start with, we are not going to be able to fund our social security systems. Diabetes today is, is rampant, um, for example, but diabetes is a preventable disease. Vaccines are extremely important as an investment simply because this is a way of protecting the world's um, population. Now, one of the things that we're working on as a company is how do we get vaccines at an even lower cost? There are roughly 10 million babies born every year between the United States, Europe, and Japan. Outside of those three regions, though, there are 100 million babies born every year in emerging markets. All of those need to be protected with the same vaccines that, that uh, are, are used in, in the Western world. But we need to get those at a lower cost and at a, at a, broader, um, at a broader distribution. Now, a lot has also occurred in terms of what we understand about disease and, and how we can, we can solve things. There's obviously things like antibiotics and, and penicillin, but you know, the discovery of the genetic code of DNA is probably going to be the most significant thing uh, that has happened in, in science. We've seen the decoding of, of the human genome, two worldwide projects here in Europe and in the US. But it's also fair to say that that decoding of the human genome hasn't really led to um, the immediate discoveries that we all thought it would do. And the reason is, is that actually your DNA is like computer program. And it's going to affect things like proteins in the body, and how each DNA communicates to a protein, whether the protein gets uh, formed or not, is really at the root uh, of a cause of disease. So today's world is really most fascinating in science because there's such an explosion of knowledge in what causes a disease. And, and at a time when it is actually very difficult to fund a new idea given capital markets, the science has actually never been more promising. And, and so you know, as we look out for the next 10 years, we're going to be in a much different world in terms of how we treat people. We are now starting to redefine diseases. We used to define a disease around symptoms. Now we can identify diseases around cause. You might not think some forms of heart disease and asthma, for example, have anything to do with each other. But when you understand that there's an underlying inflammation cause behind this, actually what you want to study is how do you solve inflammation not necessarily asthma or cardiovascular disease. But these are the types of things that we're discovering today. Um, and, and we should also uh, remember that, that things like imagery techniques have been a huge um, a benefit. You know, people are talking about the, the contribution that Steve Jobs made. Uh, but one of the things that most people don't know, uh, one of his biggest contributions was not just the iPhone. He invented a company called, he developed a company called Pixar. Most people know Pixar because of Toy Story. But Pixar technology was actually extremely important in the development of a lot of the scans that we now use for diagnosis. And, and that technology really enabled uh, a whole new world of opportunity to really understand things like cancer, um, for example. Now, just talking about cancer, this is, there's still today no greater fear, I think, that for most people than ever to think about the diagnosis of cancer. What's the cause for it? How do we detect it and screen it? We've made huge progress on that. Um, in 1970s, one in two people survived at least five years. Today, that's two to three. We have uh, at least 11 million cancer survivors in, in the US alone. But we've introduced things like pap smears. We've introduced things like um, mammograms. We've introduced uh, things like um, uh, prostate screenings, melanoma screenings. And, and these are also preventative measures which are having a, a huge beneficial impact in addition to all the drugs that have been developed. But we also still don't have a cure for cancer. We've been able to significantly reduce the rate of, of cancer death. We've cut it in half. But it's also fair to say today that a cancer diagnosis still represents a huge fear for people. And we still haven't been able to really resolve that. And, and Steve Jobs' untimely death is really a call really still to action that we need to do a better job in the fight against cancer. You know, HIV is an extremely interesting um, model. I, I hosted uh, in, in California two weeks ago a weekend just on how do we innovate innovation? How do we get more of the science actually to benefit a patient? 
In 2010, in the United States, there were about $100 billion spent on research and development, roughly two-thirds from the private sector, one-third from the public sector. But the FDA only approved 22 new medicines and vaccines in 2010. So one of the things that the whole academic and biopharmaceutical world is really wrestling with is how do we translate some of these great ideas into a benefit to a patient much faster? And, and that means that we're going to have to have different ways of working. Now, HIV is an example of how we could do that. I joined this industry pretty much the year that the first medicine against HIV was introduced. And at that point, nobody knew how big this could get. Now, you'll see shortly that we, we've understood how to transform this, at least into a chronic disease, in Western Europe and the US. But it is still uh, uh, essentially a pandemic in, in many parts of the world, 34 million people. Uh, 1.8 million deaths still per year, and the rate of infection is, is still um, growing rampantly. But you also see in all of this, healthcare and economics are still related. Uh, because of HIV, uh, it's assumed that, that growth in Africa has been reduced by about two to four points per year because of this. So what do you see? Well, where you see that we are making progress. Now, if you look at the uh, graph for Sub-Saharan Africa, it, it looks like we're doing a great job. The only thing I would point out to you is that the scale up there is on millions in South Africa, whereas for all the other regions, it's in thousands. So it is still a huge area. But one of the things that we did was have a massive collaboration to fight against HIV. So in, 19, in the late 1980s, we didn't know how to treat this. We then introduced a few drugs. We had some tox uh, issues, toxicity issues with that. And here we are a relatively short time later with one pill, once per day, you can actually manage uh, HIV as a chronic disease. New models in Africa have been developed in terms of how do, you, how do you provide a medicine where there is no market? Whether you take the Global Fund, whether you take the, uh, the Gates Foundation initiative. There have been new economic models where the industry will sell at a no cost, no profit basis. And others are stepping in where a marketplace doesn't exist. And now you have over 3 million people a year being treated for HIV. It's not enough. And more needs to be done, um, particularly on healthcare infrastructure. But there was a lot of innovation. And as we look at other diseases, what happened in HIV, the level of collaboration, the private-public partnerships, the new funding mechanisms that came along, I think are, are instrumental and, and are being studied today in terms of how, how we can make science help patients on a faster basis. Now, as much has been done, um, there are still huge amounts to be done. Climate change is occurring. We've all heard about global warming. This is having a huge impact. It'll have implications for, for respiratory disease. One of the most interesting things that I found was we're developing a, a vaccine for dengue. Now, dengue is most largely known as a, a disease that occurs in the southern hemisphere, roughly 250 million people every year. But interestingly, because of global warming, those mosquitoes are moving north. And we now see some signs of dengue in southern Florida, southern Texas, uh, and even on the Côte d'Azur in, in France. So this is the way in which global climate change is going to have an impact on healthcare, and we're going to have to research in areas of this. As, although we've developed drugs for things like TB and malaria, we're also seeing uh, resistance. So we're going to need new solutions in this area as well. Children are still dying unnecessarily. 7.6 million children under the age of five died in 2010. Now, there are diseases that you've probably never heard of. You've probably never heard of a rotavirus, um, for example. If you have a rotavirus in, in Europe or the US, your child has severe diarrhea and may spend some time in the hospital. Outside of those areas, two million children a year die um, from this disease. There are vaccines that are available, and we need to work on getting those vaccines better and actually in the hands of, of people. As much has been done on cardiovascular disease, um, we still have huge amounts of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes is probably the most significant of these. There are over 350 million people in the world who suffer from type 2 diabetes, and this is in every country in the world. If you talk to the Chinese Minister of Health, he will tell you that his top three or priorities are cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And, and you can go pretty much to any health minister in the world and you're going to hear the same things. Now, what's interesting is that actually prevention can play a role in all three of those. Two-thirds of cancer, preventable. 
Most type 2 diabetes preventable, and we can certainly prevent people from moving forward in the disease because these are progressive diseases. When healthcare systems were in, invented in the 1920s, it was all about a car accident. It was all about somebody fell down a, a well. Somebody had a difficulty with a pregnancy. One person had an incident mutualized across a large population. Today, in the United States, 50% of Americans have a chronic disease. 75% of our healthcare budgets are going to chronic diseases. And yet, we continue to build more hospitals and not think about how do we change um, people's behaviors, how do we use inter, uh, uh, education. And this is where technology is starting to play an interesting role. The fact that pretty much everybody has a cell phone is an opportunity to interface with a patient in a much different way. And governments, insurance companies, and the like are all starting to use different technologies to, to influence healthcare. So I wouldn't want you to get the feeling just because I run a drug company that I believe that a medicine is always needed to, to solve our healthcare problems. We're going to need to continue to research. We need new medicines, but we also need new models in, in healthcare insurance and how we fund that and how we get people healthier if we want to balance the accounts anywhere in the world. And I would also point out the aging population is having a huge impact. Diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are going to dramatically increase in incidence. Not because of the disease, but because we're all living longer and longer and we get these diseases. You know, 20, 25 years ago, before that life expectancy curve went up, people died before they got these diseases. Now people are living longer and we're finding these diseases. Age-related macular degeneration is another one. And these are going to have huge costs for us. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's patients need huge amounts of care. If we don't find a treatment for this, this is going to increase the cost just for the U.S. alone and their two government-sponsored programs by over $100 billion annually by 2030. So if we can actually find research that, that creates a true uh, benefit for Alzheimer's patient, we're clearly going to do a great job for patients. But we're also going to be able to find a way to avoid the inevitable costs that are starting to accumulate just because we're all living longer. Parkinson's disease is the same thing. Parkinson's uh, cost today $27 billion in medical bills and lost wages. Because one of the other things that we don't always remember, it's not just the cost of the disease itself. But when people are sick, they're not obviously productive. But remember also that a lot of family members get involved in helping patients, like patients with Alzheimer's, like patients with Parkinson's disease. So this is absorbing a huge amount of a society's productivity to look after patients with, with heavily debilitating illnesses. And this is where we also need to find a balance as we look at new science and where we want to go. Regenerative medicine has already been shown to have a significant benefit in, in Parkinson's disease. But you're going to hear from the panel that we clearly are going to have to balance um, how we go after some of that new science. There are going to be new ethical questions raised by this. And it's not going to be for a pharmaceutical company to answer those. Those are going to be for society to, to do. But we're going to have to, as we look at this, balance the need for, for, for urgent new um, scientific solutions with the need, clearly, to make sure that everybody is comfortable with the ethics of things like stem cell research or regenerative medicine. Rare diseases. This is a, a, a huge new area um, that's opening up. Um, and, but as many diseases have, have been treated, we're still only scratching the surface. Again, in the US, where data is more uh, readily available, it's estimated that, a, that a, a, an approximately 25 million Americans suffer from one rare disease or another, although there may not be more than two or 3,000 people with any particular disease. Out of that 25 million people, we can treat today 2 million. So 23 million people in the US, and you can imagine that there's a similar number in, in Europe, and, and multiply that by the world's population everywhere for whom we can't um, offer treatment today. So as I come to a close, I think, what do we really need to do here? You're going to see, uh, on, on the one hand, some extraordinary science occurring. Regenerative medicine. Can we grow your new liver? Can we insert stem cells to actually repair the damage um, that has been done by, by Parkinson's? But which stem cells? Are they embryonic, or do they come from, from one of your hairs? There's stem cells all over your body. 
And you can hear that, well, if you can have a stem cell from a human hair, why do we need an embryonic stem cell? Well, the reality is, is that various stem cells go through mutations along their life. An embryonic um, stem cell has not had any mutations yet. A human hair has a stem cell that has gone through numerous um, uh, mutations, and when we use those, we found that we actually create tumors um, for that. Doesn't mean that that's gonna be a roadblock, but these are the, some of the issues that are having to be dealt with in science. Better understanding of human biology. It's not enough to decode the human genome. We actually have to know how each and every person's DNA interfaces with other parts of the body and how this actually regulates disease. Personalized medicine is already here today. Anyone who has cancer diagnosed today is, is likely to have their tumor genetically analyzed. Breast cancer, for example, has at least three known uh, drivers of the tumor. And depending on which driver is behind a person's breast cancer, we can now figure out which treatment will be the best uh, for, the, for that breast cancer patient. And breast cancer, for example, is one of those diseases where we've seen a huge progress in survival rates. But I can tell you this, as little as 10 years ago, we would take all breast cancer patients and give them every new type of, of treatment to see what works. And now we know that a lot of drugs don't actually work in some people, largely because the genetic makeup is different. So increasingly, we are gonna be able to use genetic information to make sure we know either A, who's gonna to respond to a drug, or maybe who will have a side effect to the drug. Nanotechnology, you heard on about, where the real interesting thing about nanotechnology is this changes how a drug gets metabolized in the body, and you can avoid an awful lot of uh, side effects as a result of that. But we also need to innovate innovation. In science, if you meet scientists, you're gonna see an awful lot of solo performers. You don't meet an awful lot of jazz bands. People do not collaborate enough. And there's a growing trend to convergence, bringing different skill sets together because we clearly need to accelerate how some of this science is gonna benefit someone. If we wanna really make a difference in Alzheimer's, we're gonna to have to take a much different approach to the, to the long linear approach. But again, all of that has to be done in the context where, where society feels comfortable. So in closing, because of the way science is growing, we need a different regulatory environment. Now to give you an example of that, we know that if we can use combination therapy, we use two drugs instead of one drug uh, against a tumor, for example, we can, we can make a difference on that. But it may be that neither drug works individually. And in the current regulatory environment, you cannot have a combination therapy approved unless both individual drugs were approved. The FDA recently made a landmark change in the regulatory environment where you can now have a combination approved without having to show that either drug independently works uh, in terms of safety and efficacy. Largely because we know genetically, if we do that, they won't work. But these, this, is, this has been a long dialogue and, 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 and that's appropriate to make sure that patients are protected. But at the same time, many patients will also say, we don't want to be safely sick. We want to be safely well. And these are the things that, that are going on in today's scientific world. And that's why we also need a, a more robust risk benefit model. Here in France, we've been going through a, a drug scandal. But part of the problem is, is that there is no risk benefit model. You know, um, it's decided on a, on a product by product basis. And this has occurred around the world. Some areas of research are being completely abandoned because we don't understand the risk benefit model. Obesity is one. Obesity today is seen as a lifestyle issue. So there's a no tolerance for side effects. If you're treating cancer, there's clearly a tolerance for side effects, but not obesity. The result is that nobody's gonna do any research in obesity at the moment because they don't see any pathway, pathway forward to getting drugs approved. So these are some of the questions that, you know, I'd be interested in hearing how the panel addresses. But at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is, none of this is gonna help unless someone who is sick and has got an illness where you know, we don't have a, a, a good treatment today, someone who has a brain cancer tumor or pancreatic cancer, some forms of, of rare diseases, these people are still looking for hope. And what we need to collectively do is continue to find ways of funding this. We need to way, have ways of making that accessible and we need to accelerate the science to make this happen. But I will leave you with a message of hope is I have never seen science more promising today than in any time in my career. 
equally, it has never been more difficult to get a new idea financed. So um, there's an awful lot of work going on. We need to collectively think about how do we make things happen because patients are waiting for us. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Vibaka. That was an incredibly informative um, discussion um, in a very short period of time. You covered a lot of ground. Um, I like your point of innovating innovation. Um, as we move to the second part of the panel, I'd like to just give a brief introduction and um, remind you to please uh, continue to tweet and message and email. Um, and the um, questions will be running along the, so the bottom, as you know, but we will not begin addressing them, however, until the panelists have completed their presentation. So it'll be probably about 3.30, 3.35, so be patient. Um, I'd like to do a brief introduction. Um, as I was researching this panel, um, it turns out that I think this panel is called science nonfiction. I was so struck by the kinds of um, developments that are going on in today's bioethics, biotechnology, that I, you know, you might read briefly, but to really understand what's happening. And I'm just going to share a couple of them that struck my interest. One of them was bioprinting. This is called, it's called, uh, there are already labs that are printing skin. It grew out of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq where 30% of injuries involve skin. And it is now predicted in the 20 years a process that uses these polymers to print skin will become mainstream. And uh, Mr. V. Bacher discover, uh, discussed tissue engineering, manufacturing body parts entirely in a lab. No need for cadaver tissues. And according to a recent book, scientists worldwide are already engineering close to two dozen body parts, human organs in the lab, such as tracheas, bladders, lungs, and hearts. Progress is slow, but the trend line is clear. There was a trachea, man-made trachea um, uh, transplanted last July, and the patient is doing remarkably well. And finally, the idea of um, the integration of man and machine, and one of our panelists can speak specifically to that. They're currently designing prostheses with the sense of touch to replicate feeling of a cup of coffee in your hand. And scientists have begun to implant electrodes in a recent mon a rhesus monkey's brain that has allowed him to move a cursor with his thoughts. That's effectively controlling machines with thoughts. And so um, what I'd like to explore here in this panel are there, there, there's more than just these developments. And, and as Mr. V. Bakker mentioned, there's the bioethics behind it. These questions, that, when you have these kinds of developments, you need to begin to understand what are the legal constraints to use these types of developments. There's no questions for which the policy of who should, who should be creating these policies and what the ethical framework should be and when people, should go to, when people go too far. And finally, to be able to explore the societal implications. We talk about um, you know, the strain on our nation's resources, on our planet's resources. Um, and if you think they're strained now, um, you know, think about it when, you know, we have to support generations of retirees. It's a real question. To help us answer and to explore some of these questions, I have two tremendous panelists. One of them is, a, um, is uh, Mayanna Zatz. She is a professor of human and medical genetics, director of Human Genome Research Center in the Institute of Stem Cells in Genetic Disorders at the University of Sao Paulo, and president of the Brazilian Muscular Dystrophy Association. Her research interest is in genetics, neuromuscular disorder, genetics of neuromuscular disorder, and bioethics in stem cells. Mayanna has received more than 20 past awards 
and she has been actively involved in ethical, all ethical aspects related to genome research and political decisions regarding the approval of embryonic stem cell bill in Brazil. Later, uh, earlier this year, she published a book, which I just recently read in English, called Gen Ethics, Choices Our Grandparents Did Not Make. And our second panelist who will join us is Michael Korst. He's a thought leader in the area of humanity's future in the technological age. He's the author of two books, also which I read, very interesting, Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human, and most recently, Worldwide Mind, The Coming Integration of human and Humans and Machines. He also has written about emerging technologies for Wired, The Washington Post, and Technological, Technology Review, and PBS. He received his BA at Brown and a PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, and he has given over 100 lectures and university in cor uh, at universities and corporations. I'd like to first welcome Mayanna to the stage, who will be giving us a brief presentation, followed by Michael, and then we will be, please, again, as I mentioned, can they will, it, Oh, excuse me, the balloon is open for tweeting and, and questions. And um, we will begin answering them in about uh, 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mayanna Zatz. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, in 2000, I was interviewed by a French journalist called Caroline Glorion, uh, who was writing a book about already ethics in genetics. And uh, at that time, she interviewed uh, nine geneticists from different parts of the world. And very interesting, although we didn't know each other, uh, we had very uh, similar uh, answers to a lot of ethics questions that were already arising at that time. But uh, she asked me if these issues, these ethical issues, were discussed with the general public, with the society, and I said, unfortunately, no. So I'm very happy that this is happening now, that we can discuss with the general public, and um, you'll see that we have many questions that uh, are relevant to all of us. Uh, so I just launched a book last uh, month that I call Gene Ethics, Choices Our Parents Did Not Make. And this book discusses uh, some of these ethical issues and uh, is all based in real stories. So in 2003, the Human Genome Project was completed. And uh, the, the big question is how genetics tests are affecting us. What are the ethical issues? So we can think of two situations. Uh, first, we have families with patients affected at risk for genetic disorders, and genetic testing are very important for diagnosis, for identification, genetic counseling of at-risk carriers, and for prenatal and pre-implantation diagnosis. And each time more, you have the population tests uh, that are affecting all of us. But let me tell you uh, some results, unexpected results that are happening in practice, and then I would like very much to discuss these issues with you. For example, we have a couple that comes for genetic counseling because they have a daughter with a genetic, suspected genetic disorder, and they want to do the DNA testing to uh, confirm the diagnosis and to see if there is a risk for an affected child. So we take blood samples, we take DNA from the three of them, and what happens? We find out that the father is not the father. So the question is, should we disclose it or not? What is the opinion of the bioethicist? And I'm not going to tell you now, I want to discuss this later. But just for you to have an idea, this happens in 10% of the cases we see. The men are always shocked when I tell that. Uh, another example is uh, you find a mutation responsible for a genetic disorder in a normal control. 
sorry. But the control doesn't know, he or she, that he was tested for this specific gene. Should we contact the person or not? And that is an important question because uh, in the States, if you give a sample to be a control, the sample is decodified, you are a number, and nobody can trace you back. While in Brazil, uh, we keep the name. It's confidential, but they keep the name and the record of the person. So if you need to recontact the person, this is possible. The first issue in the States that uh, samples are decodified is because you want to keep the confidentiality of the person. But the, this is a pros. But the cons is that you find a mutation that could benefit a person, you never be able to contact this person again. So I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but that's, that's an important question that affects all of us. Then you have the question of embryo selection. Uh, you can, uh, when you have a, uh, an eight, year, eight cells embryo, you can take one cell from the embryo and you can analyze for the presence of uh, mutations. And this is very important when you have at-risk couples for very uh, severe disorders because they have the chance to implant uh, embryos that are, uh, don't have this mutation, that are free of the mutation. But then you have the ethical questions. What are the limits? For example, for late onset disorders, uh, like for example, hereditary cancer, or you have the question of savers babies, babies that are selected to be compatible to save an older uh, brother or sister that has a, 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 a hematological disorder like leukemia or another blood disorder, and you can take out the blood of the umbilical cord of the baby and try to save uh, this uh, child. And this has been, uh, uh, there was a movie, a very important movie recently about that. Or you have the question of deaf couples, that they want to select embryos that are deaf like them. They say that it's very important for them because they will be able to communicate better if the child is also deaf. And they defend the right of silence. So is it ethical or non-ethical? And then you have normal characteristics, that each time it will be more possible to select for normal characteristics. And there's a very interesting book that is called The Ethics of Genetic Choice. So one question that is very, it's happening all over, it's what would happen if couples could choose the gender, boy or a girl? Do you think that we will have the same distortion that happened in China or in India or not? So this is also an important question for the, for the auditorium. For the, or genes that confer greater ability for sports. Or to other traits such as intelligence, height, eye color, intelligence. What happened with the children that were born from the Nobel Prize sperm bank? This was a bank that, that uh, had uh, occurred in, in the States and there was a very interesting book about uh, so my question is, what will be the complaints of the design babies? I didn't want to be a boy. I want to be a girl. I didn't want to have blue eyes. I didn't want to, to do a sport. I like music, for example. So this will probably happen, and the parents would be blamed. Then you have the direct consumer genetic testing, which is also happening uh, already. And you can, you have different situations. For example, uh, you can be tested to have an increased risk for late onset disorder where, when you don't still have treatment like Alzheimer or Parkinson. And the question is, do I want to be tested if there is no treatment yet? Or you can test if you have genes that confer an increased chance to be overweight when you eat fatty food. And my question, do I need to be tested for that? <laughs> or genes that confer greater ability for sports? Should children be tested? What would be the impact of a positive or a negative test on parents' expectation? 
and this is already being offered also. And finally, we'd like to discuss the issue of stem cells. Uh, the Dolly revolution, uh, as it was just uh, said, uh, showed for the first time that adult mammals could be, uh, cells could be reprogrammed and go back to the embryonic stage and originated all body tissues. So it opened a new field of research very important of regenerative, uh, the future of regenerative medicine, but then also opened many ethical issues. For example, the use of frozen embryos. Another issue is tissue and organ replacements. How much it's facts, how much is fiction. And you, need, you read a lot in the media, but not all is, is true. So what will be really feasible? And finally, the issue of reproductive cloning. Now, we know that it's impossible to do reproductive cloning with humans, but if in the future it will be biological safe, would be ethical, and who should be cloned, and who would decide? So these are the questions that I would like to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Michael Kohorst will be coming up to the stadium, uh, to the podium, stadium, <laughs> to be able to um, discuss a few of his uh, insights. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Zatz has done a wonderful job of explaining that as our control over our bodies increases, so do our ethical issues. If you don't have control over something, you don't have any ethical issues regarding it. If you can, you do. I'm a writer, a science writer, and as such, I very frequently talk to scientists and to engineers about the technologies that they create. I did not choose that career at random. I chose it because I have deafness. I was born with severe hearing losses in 1964 because my mother had rubella rubella when she was pregnant with me. So I was born with a severe hearing loss. I got a hearing aid when I was three and a half, which worked just fine for me until I turned 36. On one day, on July 7, 2001, I lost all the rest of my hearing. So that hearing aids could no longer help me. That was when I decided to get a cochlear implant. That was also the point at which I became a science writer, because I decided to write a book about what it's like to go completely deaf and to learn how to hear all over again with an implanted neural technology. So in a couple of minutes, I just want to introduce you to what one neural technology can do, the cochlear implant. So what you see up here is a cutaway diagram of an ear with a cochlear implant installed in it. You can see the ear and the ear canal and the eardrum to the left. To the right, you see the inner ear, which is that snail-shaped organ. It's called the cochlea, which is a Latin word for snail. In a normally functioning ear, the cochlea has tens of thousands of tiny hairs inside it. And those hairs vibrate as sounds sweep through the cochlea. As those hair cells vibrate, they trigger nerve endings that send sound information to the brain. And you can see that auditory nerve on the right side of the slide. The reason that most deaf people are deaf is because those hair cells are gone. In my case, I lost all of the remaining hair cells so that no hearing aid, no matter how loud, would help me. So I got a cochlear implant. So let me walk you through cochlear implant 101. On the outside, on the surface of the head, you see a disc. That is a radio transmitter that is attached to something that looks like a hearing aid, but it's not a hearing aid. This is a cochlear implant processor. 
with a magnetic radio transmitter attached to it. The processor picks up sound and digitizes it. The magnetic disc is a radio transmitter that sticks to the implant through the skin. So there is no gap in the skin. The implant sticks magnetically to the implant through a layer of skin. The implant itself, which I actually have in my pocket here, well, this is not my implant. This is a model of an implant. This picks up the radio signal, and it decides which of 16 electrodes inside the inner ear to fire. And if you look at that close-up, up above the inner ear, you can see that string of 16 tiny electrodes wrapped around the auditory nerves in the inner ear. As those electrodes turn on and off, the auditory nerves fire. And that sends a sensation of sound to the brain. So that's Cochlear Implant 101. Now, I want to try to give you an inkling of what the world sounds like to me. To illustrate the fact that although technology works, it doesn't perfectly reproduce the way normal bodies behave. Now, I may not be able to control the clicking with this. So let me ask if the magic elves in the control booth can do this. So if you could click on the eight channel button for me, I really appreciate that. Could you do that again, please? Now, that is a recording of an English sentence that has been electronically filtered to resemble what a cochlear implant gives to the user. The eight-channel simulation is what an eight-channel cochlear implant gives to the brain. What do I mean by eight channels? There are 16 electrodes in my cochlear implant and when the device was first turned on in 2001, the software used each pair of electrodes to give me one section of the frequencies of the world. So it sent the very lowest frequencies to the two electrodes closest to the top of the cochlea, or rather, the top of the spiral. The highest frequency sound it sent to the two electrodes at the bottom of the electrode array. So that eight-channel simulation gives you some idea of what the world sounded like to me. Now let me ask, how many of you could understand that sentence? Okay. Now I want to play you the 16-channel version. So would you go ahead and play that, please? Okay, try it again. Can you hear the difference? Can you hear the difference in quality between eight channels and 16 channels? Play it one more time, if you would. Six, 16 channels, please. The 16 channel version gives a set of frequencies to each one of the 16 electrodes individually. And when I got the software to do that, that doubled my frequency resolution. So as you can hear, the sound is understandable, but it's not great. To give you an inkling of the difference between what you hear and what I hear, I'm now going to play the original unedited sound file. So would you play the original, please? I like to play tennis. The difference between that original and the 16-channel version should give you some idea of the difference between what you hear and what I hear. The reason I played the simulation is to show that although we have tremendous and increasing capabilities over the workings of the body, genetically, neurally, pharmaceutically, and in many other ways, they still fall short of perfectly reproducing what a normal body can do. You know, as Maya pointed out so effectively, the fact that we have these kinds of technologies that can make completely deaf people like me here raise a host of ethical issues. So I'm going to name just one, and I hope you will start tweeting your questions so that we can sit down and start discussing them. So to name just that one question, it is now possible 
to give eternally deaf infants a cochlear implant. And because they have one, the parents may feel no need to expose them to sign language, so they will not grow up in the signing deaf community. The issue that brings up is that the signing deaf community in many countries, which has a rich language, a rich history, a rich culture, is at risk of extinction. So the question I will leave you with is, should we care? And if we should care, what, if anything, should we do about it? So with that, I'll wrap up and let Tani take over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayanna and Michael. Um, the one thing, as you were closing, Michael, I was thinking that it's so important to understand, both through what Mayanna was talking about and Michael was talking about, that there are unintended consequences to these advancements. And I think that it's very, very important for us to understand in order for us to be able to make policies and decisions about some of these new advancements is what are those unintended consequences. And this is what we're going to try to do um, at least what I'd like to do is give you enough information to ask the right questions. There are no answers right now since this is all so new, but at least we can stimulate some conversation about that. Um, I have a couple of questions that I've created for the panelists, but I'm very anxious to hear from you, as are the panelists. And we've also created a couple questions to ask you. So a little bit later, just before we close, we're going to um, ask you uh, if we have time, one or two poll questions. So um, what I'd like to know is, um, this is an interesting question. How far are we from the scenario like Galact Gidactic Gidactica? It's a movie that we actually spoke about when we were reporting the panel, where you select the mental and physical skills of your child and decide if he's good at t tennis. And Mayan, why don't I start, start with you? I think that we are very far away from that because traits like intelligence, for example, depend a lot on environment. Uh, and most of our traits, our, the common traits, are what we call multifactorial, depends of genes, but a lot of our environment. So I think it's still a fiction, a big fiction, to, to think about this movie and what, what this movie uh, talks about. Let me answer that. I highly recommend that movie. Um, it's, it's called Gataka, and it's spelled G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -T -T -A. And it is probably the best Hollywood movie about the ethics of genetic modification. And I, I very much agree with Mayana um, that that kind of future of being able to selectively choose for intelligence and physical strength and disease resistance is very far off because while we're learning a great deal about genetics, the complexity of the interaction between genetics and environment is still very poorly understood. So even if we could magically make a child's genes the same as, say, Albert Einstein's in the area that we think codes for intelligence, the way that child grows up, the way they're exposed to various environmental influences will not necessarily mean that they will turn out like Albert Einstein. Yes, but what about uh, prenatal diagnosis for genetic disorders, for known mutations? For example, you have, what is your opinion about a couple that is uh, deaf and they want to select uh, embryos that are deaf or having a normal children? What is your opinion about? You are a person that is living with, with this, and so you are the best person to decide uh, how how, what's your feeling about? What is your position about? Well, ultimately, I wouldn't say I'm the best person to decide. The, in the end, it has to be the parents who make that decision. But I would disagree with the choice that this couple made to select for a deaf child genetically. So the, the, the story is that there is this deaf couple, a lesbian couple, by the way, who asked for the ability to 
selectively choose one of their embryos that carried their genetic mutation for deafness so that, so that that child would have a very high chance of having the same kind of deafness that they do. And this was a very controversial thing when it came out. Now, the, the argument here is that they wanted to preserve their culture. They wanted to ensure that child would be deaf so that it would have to be brought up in the signing deaf world so they would have no choice but to perpetuate the culture that they were in. And my, my response to that is, is that it's never fair to pre-decide a person's options in advance by limiting them. So to force a child not to hear so that it can only be in one culture, despite whatever its own desires may be, I think would be a hugely flawed decision to make. Yes, I agree with you. I think that all of us would like to be deaf sometimes, particularly when you have to hear political <laughs> speech, right? But, <laughs> but it's our decision, not, not something that is irreversible. Um, there's another um, question here. Well, getting off of that, um, and then I'll address one more here, but we talked about yesterday in our pre-panel about screening, not just for deafness, but screening prenatally for disabilities. And we began to talk about what happens if we continue to screen for disabilities, and then what happens as society, for, for the people who are screened for disabilities, and then they, um, there's less and less of them because maybe people choose not to um, choose that particular embryo. Um, what happens to, to the humans, to the people in um, society who have those disabilities? Is, the, is that something that we need to consider like in terms of technological classes and things that need to be cured? And, and we started talking about, so what does, what, what is the question of being normal? You know, what does it mean to be normal? So we were talking about that, Michael. Do you want to take that question? Sure. We were having this fascinating discussion last night about this. So questions came up like, if you could screen a child for genes that correspond to autism or Alzheimer's, should we prevent the implantation of an embryo that carries those genes? And part of the argument that we discussed was that, well, the argument of essentially biodiversity or genetic diversity that in order to have a full world, you need to have all kinds of difference and variation. And my, my argument was that you don't need this ability to have diversity. That even in a population where there is no disability, you'll still have a tremendous amount of genetic, cultural, and just plain personal variation. So although people with Asperger's do make the argument that because they have a very unique way of thinking, and that's worth preserving. There are people like Temple Grandin, for example, who have successfully leveraged the disability of autism to see things in very fresh perspectives. And that's a very, that's a very understandable argument. But I think it overlooks the fact that people like Temple Grandin went through a tremendous amount of suffering in, in their childhood. Um, people who are born deaf, even when they successfully managed to overcome that, they still have to go through a great deal, as I did w when I was growing up. So I just don't feel that, that we should preserve a disability if we, can, if we can eradicate it. Because even without disability, there's tremendous scope for, for variation in cognitive thinking. Yes, I agree with that. And what I think is that uh, uh, there are many disorders that were untreatable and now are treatable. For example, hemophilia. So the, it's a completely different approach if you say, well, I don't want to have a child that will die in their 20s, for example, with muscular dystrophies uh, versus a child that will have some disorder, but it's treatable. And each time we know that with the advance of technology, you, you can treat it be better. Mm -hmm. But I think, and I defend, that this is the parents' decision. I think that the parents are the ones that have to decide if they want to have or not a child with, with a right. specific disorder. Well, let, me, can let me just break into that. Because, you know, I, I said that, right? I said the parents should decide. But, you know, maybe they shouldn't. I mean, maybe they should not be allowed to choose for a child that will have a grave disability. Perhaps that should be outlawed. Yes, but in many countries, and Brazil is one of them, uh, abortion is not allowed. Even when you diagnose a child, a, a, a 
two, three, ten weeks pregnancy that the child is going to be affected for, with a severe disorder. And I defend that this should be the parent's decision and not a law that is imposed to, to the couple. Mm. Along those lines, the, there's two questions here that, that actually um, address both of these in, uh, issues. One of them is um, infant mortality reduction is the best progress of science, but means less Darwinian selection, thus prolifer proliferation of genetic diseases. Is that something, Mayana? Yes, you can uh, on? each time when, when you control uh, infectious diseases and other disorders, the relative uh, importance of genetic disorders is each time uh, higher. Now, uh, in, at, in the States, 50% or more of the children that are born, that, are, that die in the first year of life, are because of genetic disorders. So the more you control True. the other... Oh, yes. The more you control uh, infectious disease and other disease, the most important are the uh, importance, uh, the, the proportion of genetic disorders. So it's sort of like a reverse, um, it, it's, it, 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 it's almost like reverse progress in a way, no? You, no, because there are much less children that, that die. For one, 100 it's years it's ago, ago there, you had more uh, than 100 uh, children. Okay. But, the, but the proportion of genetic diseases. The relative the, the proportion. proportion. Yes. So it's, it's in relative numbers. Yes. Um, something that um, somebody, we were talking briefly about abortion, and um, this, is a, this is a question I'm, I'm putting out there, but there are no answers because we're, we're constantly asking this question every day, but are we willing to have genetic screening that might lead to abortion? And that's effectively what we were talking about, where abortion for certain people is also an ethics and a religious issue. So again, it's, it's hard to say, you were talking about this yesterday. Do you want to give us an example? Uh, yes, I think that's a very important issue because what was shown, and this is, happens all over the world, that when you start offering a prenatal diagnosis, the number of abortion in at-risk families decreases because there are many women that get pregnant by accident. They know that they are at high risk of having an affected child, and they tell us, I don't want to take any risk. I'm going to interrupt this pregnancy. But once you are able to make a, a genetic diagnosis, most, in most of the cases, you can tell the, the, the baby is normal. You don't have to interrupt the pregnancy. And the, pregn uh, the number of interruptions in families at risk, at high risk, decreases in all the uh, countries that offer genetic counseling and genetic diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis. It's very interesting. There's a question that um, you had spoken about designer babies, and I was actually struck by that. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the ethical issues surrounding the right not only to choose the sex of your baby, but ultimately other genetic tra uh, traits, such as body type, personality, intelligence. Should we be able to make these discrimina discriminatory choices? Michael? Well, to make the question very concrete, if my parents could have chosen a gene that would have guaranteed that I'd be six feet tall instead of five foot three, <laughs> should they have chosen that? Okay. <laughs> now, that's a really difficult question to answer, right? You know, personally, I would have liked to be six feet tall, but the fact that I'm five foot three gives me a very unique kind of perspective on the world. But this, let me give another example that I think speaks a little more directly to that. So. There have been tremendous advances in the ability to, to save children who would, would nearly have died at birth, okay, with advanced medical techniques in the, in the OBGYN ward. And that sounds like it's a great thing, right? Wow, we can, save, we can save babies who would have died 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But the consequence of that, so my mother, she teaches in a nursery school for deaf children, okay, strange but true. And because of the fact that more children survive things that would have killed them, the population of that school is actually going up instead of going down. Because more children survive with severe disabilities than would have survived 20 years ago, meaning tremendous outlays of, of resources, parent, parental time, these special schools than were necessary 20 years ago. So this is an example of the unexpected consequences that, that Tati was talking about. So it's like, it's as you're saying, when you push the button to, to do a good thing, the button that do bad things often get pushed as well without anybody intending them to happen. 
Yes, but I think that once you can treat the disease, I don't see any problem that, that you'll have more people with this, this disease, for example, di diabetes. Or you can think another thing, short-sighted. People that were very severely short-sighted, when they had to hunt, they wouldn't survive. And now you just put glasses and, or contact lens and you are okay. So there are many, many traits that you can treat now and you can have a normal life. So I, I don't think there will, there will be any problem about that. But well, the, the, the question is, what constitutes a normal life? And I don't know the answer to that question, question to anybody else, but you know, as, you know, as we all well know, the treatments to many diseases are still very partial. So diabetes, even though we can do a lot of things with insulin pumps, medications, it's still a gravely damaging disease. Should we continue to to, ex to accept that, even if we can't fully treat the consequences? Should it be just okay to have a baby who will have severe autism? Um, there's a, I did put up another question, but there was a question here that I'm just gonna, um, uh, since it uh, addresses this particular issue, how can a child become his own project if the parents are allowed to choose his future characteristics? And I loved when Mayanna was talking about, you know, <laughs> All of us, the parents of teenagers, are, you know, we're blamed for everything, but at least we can, say, you know, they can say we didn't ask to be born, but you can say, okay, that is my fault, but, you know, whatever characteristics they have, I have nothing to do with. Now, what happens when they say, <laughs> you know, as you were saying, I didn't want to be a sports athlete? Um, and again, um, you know, it's a bio, it's an ethical issue, and... It, you know, I'm not sure that there's an answer to that. I just really liked the question. Yeah, let me, let me offer a perspective on that. And there's some great books out there that actually deal with just that question. There's one by Gregory Stock called, I think, uh, like Reengineering Human Genes. There's another one by Bill McKibben called Enough, Staying Human in an Engineered Age. So anyway, um, the idea of trying to engineer a kid, I think the problem with that, you know, first of all, as Ty said, the kid's going to have his or her own ideas about things. But also, I think that people tend to just assume that biology is destiny. And we just know that that is very much not the case. Um, we all get a complement of genes that gives us various strengths and weaknesses. But what we do with those genes is totally up to us. So I think trying to engineer a kid, apart from doing things like ameliorating disabilities, like giving them genes perhaps for enhanced resistance, um, height, endurance, I think those are positive, but to try to engineer a kid to be an athlete, they might just become a neurosurgeon instead. Well, we were talking a lot about yes. the environmental. Yes, there was this, this book that I, I just showed uh, on the slide, the Nobel Prize Bank. Uh, this was a, a guy in the States called Robert Graham that made this bank because uh, he thought that people were full of idiots and they had to raise up the IQ of, of babies. Uh, so they did this bank, and, and uh, Otto, David Plotz, were able to recontact 30 children that were born from, from this bank. And what he found is that some are very smart, some are talented for music or other uh, dance, and some are, are, are pretty uh, in the low scale of, of IQ, uh, showing that it's not different from the normal population. And there was one specific boy that had an IQ of 150, and whose mother was showing him on TV all the time. And he said, this was a very stupid idea. Uh, if I would have an IQ of 100, it would be enough. The expectation they have over me is it's terrible. Yeah, interesting. I want to switch gears. There's two questions I want to ask, and then there's one other here. that um, we, we just wanted, I just want to touch on cloning. Um, we spoke about it uh, yesterday briefly about the ethical issues um, and uh, Michael had a very interesting observation um, and then there was a little bit of a debate and I'd just like to replay that. I'm going to push the button. Okay, Michael. Yeah, sure. <laughs> let's, let's push the cloning button. So, so, so when we talk about cloning, I, I pee in a line that I read, I think in Gregory Stock's book, when you clone someone, you're basically just creating an identical twin for them 30 years delayed, okay? So hearing that really helped me reframe that issue of cloning because we know that even identical twins don't always look identical and they often will not have the identical behaviors. So even minor differences in the uterine environment have profound impact on how genes are expressed and which genes are turned on and which are turned off. 
So we also talked about the project of cloning. Would it lay these heavy expectations on the kid? That's one issue. And second, what would it be like for the kid to see their clone age? And that gives you a preview. Oh my God, you know, my clone just got Parkinson's. That means I'm going to get it. But we also raised the issue of, well, okay, that clone is coming 30 years later. Maybe there's going to be a cure for Parkinson's. And maybe the clone will make better decisions than the original in their lifestyle choices. Well, that's one aspect. But the, the other uh, we, were, we are talking about is how is, would be your feeling to see you 30 years older? Because we all have see things in our parents that we don't like. But you think, well, this is not going to happen to me. But then you see you, it's you in 30 years, it's going to happen. Uh, and you're going maybe to be fat or bald if you're a man. And, and, and that's the reality. So how are we going to, to deal with this? And who should be cloned? For example, they defend that when you should clone couples that are infertile. So first of all, what will be the decision to clone the mother or the father? And imagine that you decide to clone the father and you divorce this, this man, and you hate him. And then you have a copy of him. <laughs> <laughs> it blows my mind to think about this stuff. You don't think about that when you're so excited about the, the, the opportunity of technology. But what are the unintended consequences? Um, Let me just before, jump in on that, because I don't think you would have a copy. You know what? We have five minutes, Go for so it. I'm going to cut you off, and I'm going to ask the audience a question, um, and then we're going to do a quick wrap-up, um, and I've been requested that you ask, um, that you repeat the names of the books you advise, so we'll do that before we end. So this is for everybody in the audience. Um, it's not something we touched on, but I'd like to hear your opinion, um, so please... Uh, um, Answer the question, if you may. Our DNA is available to anyone. Should our employers or health insurance companies be able to test for genes that increase our risk for certain diseases without our permission? A, yes. B, no. C, or three, it depends. If you could just answer that, if those of you who have devices to do so or not we could do a show of hands. <laughs> okay, I don't know how long it takes for the poll. Okay, let's do a show of hands. Should employers or health insurance companies be able to test for genes that increase our risk for certain diseases without our permission? Yes, oh, here we go. All right, so 20% said yes. That's actually quite interesting. 60% says no, and 20% says it depends. I'm actually quite surprised. I would have thought it would have been all no. And I'm not sure, maybe you can share with, with us what those who say yes or it depends might be thinking. Uh, well, can I tell a, a, yes, a, a story absolutely. that happened in Brazil? Okay. Um, uh, there was a, a lady that was accused to have kidnapped a boy, his name was Pedrinho, when he was 16 years old. They found out and uh, he decided uh, through a DNA test to come back to his biological parents. But then they suspected that the older sister who was 24 years at that time was, had also been kidnapped. And, but she said, I don't want to know. This w woman raised me, I like her, and I don't want to know if I was kidnapped or not. But she went to the police to talk about, she smoked a cigarette, threw it, threw it away, and they took the rest of the cigarette, analyzed her DNA, and found out that she had been kidnapped, that she was not the biological daughter of this lady. So uh, I was asked what was my opinion about it. I said, well, I think it was, they violated her right not to know. But there was a, a debate to whom it belongs discarded DNA. It belongs to the person or it's available and anyone can take it and do whatever you want. Uh, so. And that is... Those are the kind of questions with, that we would like to leave you with. I know that you're probably thinking you were hoping to get some more answers about those questions. Um, but as Mayanna and Michael can both attest, they live in this world and there are at this point seeming to be only questions. 
Um, before we close, um, Michael, can you just please uh, reiterate the names of the books that you recommended? Sure. So one's by Gregory Stock. Um, and I, the exact title skipped my mind, but something like Redesigning Humans. I think it's Redesigning Humans. Then there's a book by Bill McKibben, and it is titled um, Enough, Staying Engineered in a Human Age. And it's very good to read them together because they come to very, diff very different conclusions. It's a great combination. And in closing, I'd first of all like to thank Mayanna and Michael. They did a tremendous job preparing for this panel. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And um, I just would like to say that uh, um, when I was researching for this panel, I kept thinking, what is the concept of self in an age where we can manipulate our bodies through technology? What does it mean to be human as the flesh becomes normalized and we increase and see the integration of man and machine? And again, these are just questions for which there are no answers, but which I think are important to continue to ask as we try to develop policies. Um, I've been um, asked, I would like you to all remain seated and as we will be going directly into the next session uh, called Going Beyond Scientific Research to a Real Social Commitment. Thank you very much for your attention.